G'day, how are you doing? Another beautiful start. I'm absolutely killing this for professionalism, aren't I? Absolutely killing it. Am I coming through now? Hopefully I'm coming through now. <laughs> oh, what an absolute professional. What a professional. I just can't believe it. I'm trying to improve this stream every day, but it seems we're going backwards. We're going backwards. My webcam this morning looks a bit dodgy. Um, actually, it doesn't look too bad now, but it did look a bit dodgy before. Um, I've ordered a new webcam. I've ordered all this other stuff to upgrade the stream, make it more professional, but I think the weak link might be me. I think it's me. Leave the microphone on. Forget to turn it back on when it's critical. What's doing? You're all having a great laugh. Yep. Okay. Anyway, I'm here to entertain and um, making a fool of myself is just as much fun for everyone <laughs> as the photography stuff. All right. Who have we got here with us today? Look at this. You've all been... I'm just having a scroll through the comments. Tom Putt's been giving me a hard time. Look at the text message he just sent me. Here we go. This is this is what I have to deal with in the morning. Where where's my webcam? Can you? Hello, Tom Putt. He's a good looking fella, isn't he? He's a good looking fella. Um, that's the kind of stuff that I have to deal with while I'm trying to set up and be professional. It's all your fault, Tom. Um, Anyway, okay, what have we got today? We've got, we are four weeks in. I think this is the four week anniversary of the live stream. I think this is our 20th show. I'm pretty sure it is anyway. It might be tomorrow. Could be today, could be tomorrow. I'm not really sure, but it's roughly around four weeks. So I thought high time that I explain or introduce myself a little bit better because I just figured out yesterday that most days I don't even, I don't even say, g'day, Adam Williams here or anything like that. What's doing? Anyway, we're going to introduce myself with a bit of a journey, my journey um, through life, through photography, if you like. And then, big event on Thursday, Tom Putt is also giving us his presentation on his journey through landscape photography. And it will be an interesting comparison. I think it will be obviously very, very different photography, but maybe some of the philosophies and some of the lessons learned might be rather similar. I don't really, I don't know Tom Tom's um, behind the scenes of photography that well, but set that in your calendar, set an alarm, Thursday morning, 10 a.m., Tom Putt Live. It's our turn to give him a little bit of, uh, of a hard time back. No, give him lots of support, I mean, um, throughout the comments, I'm sure we will. What else do I need to explain before we get going or point two? We've got a free photography competition coming up in about, I'll have the details of that by the end of the week. I've been working on that the last couple of days, getting that right. If you missed out on the creating a composite photo yesterday, that went absolutely gangbusters. We set a new record for uh, viewers throughout the live stream. I think we had 218, 220. I haven't got the exact stats with me yet. They haven't come through YouTube, but it was about 218, I think, something like that. Incredible. Thank you so much for supporting this little project. And what I've decided to do, if, no, when we reach 100, 100, please, when we reach 1,000 concurrent viewers, and I could say if, but let's, let's be positive. Let's say when, when we hit 1,000 concurrent viewers, so keep sharing. Keep telling your friends, keep liking, keep commenting, keep subscribing to tell YouTube that this is a fun thing to do in the morning. And when we hit a thousand, I'm in for the long haul. I'm investing in this now. Um, when we do, when we finally do, I'm going to set up a free live half day. We'll see, half day, maybe three, four, five hours, something like that. Saturday workshop. Okay, we're going to all come together. And we'll do a free workshop with images and presentations. And I might even invite some other photographers in so it's not all, you know, I don't bore you with all me. Um, we'll get some other great photographers in to help us out there too. How does that sound? If that sounds good, give the uh, like button a thumbs up. All right. What else? I don't think anything else. Let's get into it. Have you guys still going crazy on the comments here? Are we actually coming through loud and clear? It says that's better. Oh, Okay. It's a, uh, I've got a message here from Asta Hound. 
<laughs> good with names. It was over 222. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for, um, I mean, I'm not laughing at the name, I'm laughing at my pronunciation. Absolutely useless when it comes to English. You would think it was my second language, but no, it's not. Um, this is all I've got. Um, sounds awesome. Okay, half day workshop. Let's hit a thousand. Look, I, I didn't think we'd hit 222 when we started with five or six on the first day. We've grown incredibly, you know, from five or six to 200. I think we can hit two, um, a thousand at some point. I don't know when. Two weeks, a month, two months. When we do, I'm going to set up really something special, a half day workshop. All right. I would go through all the names, but I'm useless with names, and there's so many there that will be here for half an hour. So just thank you. I know there's a lot of people there that have been with us since the beginning, and I can't every day, every morning I turn up. There's so much fun and stuff and banter in the comments, and I love it. And you guys give me so much positive energy, but also I'm always surprised that you're not sick of me yet, and you keep coming back for more. So as long as you guys keep encouraging me, I will keep producing this and keep seeking inspirational photographers to help me out like Tom Putt and uh, like Sue Well and Sadie Cook we had last week. Look up that one in the recent videos. Let's get into it. I'm Adam Williams. G'day. How are you doing? That's a bit of an in-joke for my students. They will uh, probably be cracking up about that one. But anyway, if you get it, thanks for supporting me through the online courses. Here I have my website. It's not my online course website. This is my photography what would I call it? Photography portfolio website. So if you're interested in the kind of photography that I produce, jump over there to www.australianphotographer.com. It's pretty lucky to snap all that website up, wasn't I? Um, anyway, what we're going to do today is I'm going to tell you a little bit about me, a little bit about some significant photos throughout my journey, and a little bit about everything. Yeah, fire the questions as we go. The questions are right in front of me, although you can't see them on the screen. They're right in front of me, and I'll answer them as we go as well. Okay, let's get into it. It's working. That's all I can ask at this point. It's been a rough start to the morning, but it seems to be working reasonably well. Let me just, I'm just going to tidy this up a fraction. Perfection. Okay, my journey in photos. This look, this is not one of my first photos. And for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to take you on a timeline throughout my journey from essentially being a residential builder, you know, leaving school at the age of 17. We won't touch much on that, but I will reference it because it is significant in the later part of the journey as well. And then right through wanting to become a well, essentially a full-time professional photographer escaping the world of building. So let's touch on that first. Let's touch on that first before we get into some of the images and some of the stories of those images. Um, I left school after year 12. Okay, so high school. I didn't go to university or college if you're in the States. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I know a lot of you out there who have been at my workshops have heard some of these stories before. So bear with me, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. My dad, my father was in the building game and he said, well, you know, well, you can't just sit around doing nothing and thinking about this for too long. I've set up some work experience, if you like, or some laboring with a local builder that I know very well. He's a good guy. Why don't you go and do two weeks work with him before you go off to schoolies? So schoolies in Australia is when we finish school and then we go and all get together, have a holiday for two weeks and run amok and do things we probably shouldn't be doing, drinking lots, partying lots, you know, and, and generally just, just causing chaos, okay? Um, that's generally what happens. I'm sure most of you are aware of that celebration after school. So I did the two weeks from day one, and I did 10 days, I think, from day one till day 10, I it was an absolute grind. And I was a bit of a pri privileged kid, I suppose. I'd never really done much hard work. So all of a sudden, I'm thrust into this hard work, eight hours a day, maybe 10 hours a day. 
and it was just dirty, dusty, hard, grinding work. I didn't enjoy it at all. I get up to school this week and I tell all my friends, they're like, how was work? And I'm like, well, it was okay. I got some, got some money to spend on partying, but I absolutely hated it. I'm definitely not going back to do that again. Anyway, school these two weeks or 10 days goes by. Didn't have mobile phones back then. My dad rings me up or I ring home to check in with him with a couple of days to go. Let him know I'm okay. I'm coming back. And he says, I've got great news. The builder wants you back on Monday. And this is like Saturday or Sunday. It was Saturday. Flying back on Sunday. Wants me back at work doing the same grind that I didn't enjoy at all on Monday. And I'm thinking, well... At this point, I don't have any backup option. I don't have a better option to tell my dad why I'm not going to go back on Monday. So I sort of begrudgingly said, yeah, sure. And I thought what I'll do is I'll use this, get some money together while I figure out what I'm really going to do, what I'm really passionate about, if you like. And in three months or so, I'll have a little bit of money and I'll be able to leave that work and go and maybe do something else. 17 years later, you know, finish the apprenticeship, um, become a carpenter, and then I form a partnership with one of the other guys there, have my own building company, have a whole bunch of employees, you know, turning over a bunch of money, um, trying to make a decent wage. It was always difficult and having all that stress and responsibility of, you know, producing these residential houses and renovations, all the whilst trying to keep all the employees safe and and you know all that stuff incredibly stressful for a job that if I was a hundred percent passionate about then it would still be incredibly stressful but there would be a decent balance there because it would be something that I enjoy but keep in mind I didn't enjoy maybe maybe I enjoyed a handful four or five days in those 17 years the rest of those days those 17 years were spent not wanting to get out of bed. I'm not a morning person. I had to get up at 5 a.m., 6 a.m., something like that. Not wanting to get out of bed, regretting having to go to work. And when I got to work, just checking the clock all day. When is morning tea? When is lunchtime? When can we go home? Okay, and I know a lot of you have probably had similar experiences just having to do that job. You know, I ended up getting a mortgage and having all, you know, a, a nice couple of cars and all the bills and this, that, and the other. Guess what? locked me in. I felt like I was trapped and couldn't get out. But, and a big but I suppose, a big part of my life is I've suffered anxiety and depression and that 17 year grind, I didn't realize I suffered anxiety and depression. In hindsight, I can remember having it as early as, you know, five or six or eight or 10. But it wasn't really a big thing until I really ground myself down for 17 years and then it became a huge thing. It came to the point where I was exhausted. I could hardly get through a day. You know, I know a lot of you have experienced similar things. Okay, got to the point where I had to change. I had to, had to make a change or I wasn't sure whether what the scenario was going to be, to be honest. I had to make that change. So I had a chat with my wife. We always wanted to go traveling around Australia. And by this stage, I was a passionate amateur photographer. And I'd done pretty well in a couple of competitions. And I'll show you those images in a minute. And I'd also started selling some photos at the weekend at the markets, the local markets, doing pretty well. And I thought to myself, and this was a bit of a, I guess, a bit of a dream and not really reality, I thought to myself, well, if I can sell a few more prints, whether it be online or whatnot, and, you know, draw some income from photography, maybe I can turn this dream passion into the reality of a professional photographer. So without much extra thought, my wife and I decided to both quit our jobs. We sold our house, got rid of the mortgage, we sold all the couches, the, the stuff on the shelves, the knickknacks, the furniture, you know, everything in the kitchen drawers and anything that we didn't sell on eBay, we had a giant skip bin out the front of the house and we threw everything else in the skip bin apart from the really important wedding albums, etc, etc, all the personal stuff. We had one or two of those clear crates full of the personal stuff that was really, really important. Everything else that wasn't important either sold or went in the bin. We bought a four-wheel drive and a caravan and we went traveling around Australia. We'll get back to that story in a minute. Let's skip through a bit. 
I've already skipped some of these slides to a certain degree, haven't I? Okay, early days. In the early days, this was when I first picked up a camera. So I first got my first camera back in the, well, that's not true. I was interested in photography from the early teens or maybe even as early as 10. And I had a little point and shoot film camera. And I can remember I'd go on holidays and mum would give me one roll of film or maybe two rolls of film and I would, that would be done in the first day. And then I would beg for like one or two more rolls to last me the next two weeks. So I can remember having an interest in photography as early as say 10, but you know, different distractions, sports, girls, different things came along and photography wasn't a huge influence or a huge part of my life throughout my teenage years. But when I started getting stressed in building, I fell back into photography and I bought my first digital camera. In fact, digital cameras, the invent of digital cameras was a huge part in me becoming a professional photographer because I never really understood the process of film. And back when it was film, it was much, much harder to understand that what, you know, what the ISO of the film did or the shutter speed did or the aperture did because you didn't get that instant feedback that um, digital gave me. So I could learn through that instant feedback what all those different settings did. And if digital didn't come around, I don't think I would have gotten into photography. But the year 2000, I bought myself a digital camera. It was one of the first on the market. It was a little, or not a little, it was about the size of a brick, you know, a good size thing like that. And it was a Kodak, I can't remember the exact name, but it was a grand total of, I think, one megapixel. Okay, one megapixel. You know, the photo, the card, for example, was like, I can't even remember, it was tiny. It might have even been measured in, in kilobytes rather than megabytes. If it was megabytes, it was like, one or two megabyte cards was a big card, okay? And then by the year 2004, I bought my, bought my first DSLR. And in actual fact, this is one of the first images that I captured or within the first couple of months that I captured. A Couple of months after that, as I said, I started going to the markets. And the reason why this one is significant, it was the first print I ever sold at my first ever markets. And that was huge. Someone actually wanted to buy my photography absolutely phenomenal okay this was the image and it was my best seller back then it did really really well back in those days all I wanted to do all my goal was was to produce beautiful imagery beautiful natural imagery you know no fussing about in Photoshop it was all about capturing those images as naturally as possible and a funny little thing and this will be this will be more relevant I suppose as we move through this presentation is I can remember when I was shooting with a mate he said have you seen the work of that Peter Eastway and I said no I haven't and Peter Eastway just lived in the same suburb as me at this point and I hadn't heard of him back then I feel ashamed to say that but I hadn't so I went home and I googled Peter Eastway found his website had a look through there and the next weekend I was shooting with that same mate Shannon Sakovitz if you're out there I don't think you are but if you are how you doing mate um, I need to give you a call. Anyway, um, I said to Shannon, I said, uh, yeah, I had a look at Peter's work. I don't really like it. It's a bit dark and gloomy for me. I'm really into colorful, beautiful sunrise, sunset skies and, and really getting the natural beauty out of my photography. Does that sound familiar? I think that's a place where a lot of us start out. Okay. And, and, and many of us stay there and there's nothing wrong with that either. And we'll talk more about that as we uh, progress through. But that was me. And I think for me, the most important thing at that early stage was to not lock and set myself into those boundaries. Those boundaries were there. And that's what I was doing at that particular time. But I never really chained myself and locked myself into that box. Imagine how frustrating that would be if you said, this is all I'm ever going to do. And I'm never going to reconsider those boundaries. Okay, so I think for all of us, what I would suggest is the best option, or at least was the best option for me, is by all means, have those boundaries set at that particular time in your photography journey, but always allow yourself to reconsider if that's still where you want to be, you know, down the track, okay? Because if you lock yourself into that box and that's all you're ever going to do, it can be a great source of frustration as you see other people doing the things 
that you would really like to do, but you're not allowing yourself to do that because you're locked into one specific box that you, do, that you don't feel you can leave. Okay, let's click along. Early inspiration. Early inspiration. Yeah, Tom Putt says, never heard of him. Peter Eastway, I'm sure you're not watching, but um, he's going through some tough times or had some tough days in the last um, in the last few weeks, mate. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're staying well. Stay safe and um, stay strong, mate. Um, I'm sure you're not watching, but if you are, little message for you. Uh, any questions before we keep my first digital camera? Panasonic 1.4 megabytes floppy disk. Oh man, love those. I hope you still got it. I'd love to have a play with some of those cameras. Yeah, Peter's in isolation at the moment. Yeah, I mean, okay, that can't be easy. Anyway, we're good. We're good. Let's keep trucking along. My earliest inspiration and where my love for, I suppose, natural or inspiring, let's say, breathtaking photography. I wasn't great at it back then, but... Some would say I'm still not great at it now, I suppose. I'm, they're probably right, too, to be honest. Was Ken Duncan, Australia's probably most well-known photographer, okay? And absolutely incredible photographer. And you can see in this image here um, is pretty heavily inspired by what the type of photography Ken Duncan does with those really wide panoramic vistas with really bold, vibrant colours, Okay. And in the early days, I was only ever really inspired by one photographer. And the problem, the problem or the potential problem of being having only one inspiration in your art form is you can tend to, I suppose, emulate that really, really closely. So because I only had one influence, only one photographer was coming into my circle of influence, if you like. I was tending to try and replicate that style of photography photography as closely as I possibly could. And it's not really being yourself. So, But that's fine in the early days. However you learn photography and whoever you're inspired by, in the early days, we're only really just, you know, grappling to find our feet. You know, in the early days, getting a well-focused, well-exposed photograph is an absolute win. Okay? And then being able to replicate the photography of your idols is kind of the next step in the journey. But you've got to be careful to a certain degree not to get stuck in that point either because if, you, I just, if I just kept replicating Ken Duncan, then I would just be a Ken Duncan clone and I wouldn't be the photographer that I am today, which is much, much closer to the authentic Adam Williams, whatever that happens to be, okay? And we'll get closer to what that happens to be as we move through. Don't get distracted with my annoying comments. Tom, why would I get distracted with your comments, mate? Not at all, particularly when you tag me and it comes up with big red highlighted text. Adam Williams, look at me. <laughs> I love you, mate. It's great. You keep entertaining the whole crew whilst I'm, you know, dithering away. It's a good good teamwork, mate. Laurel and Hardy. I don't even know what that reference is. I don't know them well enough. Um, good cop, bad cop. Whatever. Let's keep on going. Risk taker. I've always been a risk taker. I mean, and you probably you probably understand that a little bit because you don't sell your house. You don't sell all your possessions, you know, within a three-month period and buy a four-wheel drive and quit your job and go traveling around Australia. Now, when I say in a three-month period, that was from the time that I finally decided to do it. It really, it took probably about five or six years to really work up the courage to actually do it, to actually sell my property, to actually quit my job. I'm one that's really um, a people pleaser and I don't like breaking people's expectations of what they want. So, you know, quitting my partnership and selling the house and my parents were like, what are you doing? You've got a great job with good income and, you know, you've... You've got a nice house and cars and what do you what do you want to quit that for? I didn't really understand. You know, they supported it, but deep down they were concerned absolutely that this was not going to end well and I would have to go back to building one day. Okay. 
As far as this image here, this was one of the images that encouraged me to take risk, as well as being a risk-taking image itself. It's what do you what do we think this might be? A lot of people often think infrared. There are a couple of people thinking it's an infrared image. Keep in mind this was back in about 2000 and probably four or five. So there wasn't a lot of infrared digital cameras around it for any. Maybe there was, I'm not sure. I certainly didn't have one. What it is though, in fact, is a negative image blended together with a positive image. Okay, so we've got a standard positive foreground and then I inverted the luminosity of the image, duplicated and inverted it for the sky. So now the bright parts of the sky are the dark parts. And same with the tree. Normally a tree would be silhouetted against a bright sky, but now we have this really funky, ghostly, luminescent white tree against a dark sky. I love the effect. And this was the start of me starting to create and do some relatively strange risk-taking photography. Now I thought, why not enter this into a photo competition? Of course, the riskiest image that I've ever created, let's put it in a photo competition. Not only that, let's put it in my first ever photo competition. So I enter my first ever photo competition. It's the Loop. It used to be called the Aperture Awards. Then it was the Loop Awards. Now it doesn't exist anymore. It was a big award, relatively big, and I had some great results there. I entered into that. I think it was 2010, 2011, my first competition ever. I'm a complete amateur. There's an Amateur Awards and there's an Open Professional Awards. Which one do I enter? I'm always pushing for the bigger goal. I think, let's mix it with the pros. Enter that, absolutely. Comes back, I finish ninth. Ninth in the professional out of a couple of thousand images or so with this particular image. So a lot of encouragement. So I take that encouragement of one single photographic awards and about a handful, four or five, six sales at the markets, quit my job, as you do. Okay, I see at that particular Loop Awards photo competition, eighth position, Peter Lick, an incredibly famous, incredibly successful, almost ex as successful as Tom Putt, almost. Australian born, but USA based photographer. For those of you that are in the USA, you might have been into a Peter Lick gallery. Um, if you have, absolutely spectacular. He used to have some galleries in Australia. I'm not sure he still does. There was one at Noosa. I was very aware of that. I was very aware of him. There's him in eighth. There's me in ninth. I'm thinking, he's making millions of dollars a year. Surely, surely I can make a, a go of this photography thing. Okay, it didn't work out that easily. But this was my new life. Went from a four-bedroom, three, four-bedroom house. Can't remember now. I think it was four. Four-bedroom, beautifully, fully renovated. I'm a builder house. Two, this little tin can on the back of a four-wheel drive. It was amazing. I was trying to escape my anxiety. I was trying to escape my troubles. I was trying to escape the building game and get into being a professional photographer. And what I thought was, my images are already awesome. They're fantastic. I'm already there. You know, I'm one step behind Peter Lick. In fact, it's only eighth, ninth. I'm really right there. You know, we're really on level par. Completely delusional absolutely completely delusional but the great thing about being completely delusional is you do some crazy things that you probably shouldn't do like quitting your job selling your house and going traveling around Australia for two years okay and you chase dreams that are probably crazy unattainable to people that are not completely delusional okay you got to be a little bit delusional the thing about my creative journey and my photography in general my opinion of my own photography sits in either two places. I'm either very, I either think it's just absolutely awesome and I'm going great guns, you know, those kind of things, or I think it's the worst thing ever and I can't understand why anyone else would ever like it or how it ever gets into the top three or wins a photo competition or this or that. I just can't understand it. There is no middle ground. I'm either overly confident or completely no confidence at all. But that's fantastic. I love that about myself because when I'm overly confident, I say yes to things like quitting jobs and traveling Australia and standing up in front of 200 people and presenting a live photography conference. I'm not talking about the YouTube stuff, but I'm talking about 
seated people in a venue, in a pavilion and, and talking to 100, 200 people. Um, absolutely nerve wracking. Guess what? My biggest fear three or four years ago was public speaking. I used to panic if I was the best man at a wedding. Okay. Now talking to a couple of hundred people in a venue and seeing all those eyes staring back at me, it's kind of fun. It gives me a lot of energy and a real high, much like you guys give me each day with allowing me to do this. You know, I kind of feel like I'm sitting here talking to myself, talking to the little green light on my computer monitor, but all the comments and positive feedback that you give me is a real rush. Okay. So having those highs and lows like a lot of artists do is great because it gives me the confidence to do things that I wouldn't normally do. But when I'm in the low points, it gives me the kick in the pants to say, look, keep yourself in check. Keep your ego in check. You need to improve. You need to get better. You need to be this, that, and the other. You know, it's just a great kick in the pants to get better. Because if you're always at the highs, you're never going to you're never going to progress. And if you're always at the lows, you're never going to have the confidence to say yes to things that you don't think you're capable of. To be honest, when I quit my job, I didn't really think I was capable of being a professional photographer. And when I said yes to my first presentation at a camera club, I didn't think I was capable of doing that essentially for a living. Last year, I traveled Australia again and I did about 40 live workshops. My living was public speaking for an entire year. Who would have seen that coming? And I still get nervous every single time. Okay, but this was what it was. But Just checking the questions. Oh, Roberta says she had to travel to treat her anxiety as well. Yeah, I know what that I know what that feels like. And she says it's very hard at the moment. Thank you for being honest and sharing that because I am finding this on a level of anxiety tremendously difficult. But there's also a lot of people out there that are experiencing high anxiety for maybe even the first time in your life. I guess I'm a bit lucky in that I've experienced this consistently for a lot of years so I kind of know what it feels like and I know that you know my world's not about to end even though I think it's about to end quite regularly okay um, so for those out there that are doing it tough at the moment do what you can you know do that exercise eat healthy I mean it's all cliche but it does it does work eat healthy drink lots of water get some exercise turn the phone off yesterday I had a phone free day well, particularly from news events, and today I'm going to do the same thing. I would recommend, yeah, really just switching off the news for a couple of days. I was joking yesterday that I don't watch the news much anymore, to the point when Australia eases back on this social distancing type stuff, I could be two or three months more in social distancing before I figure out that I'm allowed to go back to normal social activities because I, I might not look at the news. Okay, so um, anyway... Turn the phone off for a couple of days and, and have a chill, read a book. And I think that helps for me. It helps for me. The reality. So I've sold the house. I've quit my job. I've done all of that. And I'm three months into this trip and I'm getting some great sunrises and some great sunsets. I'm going out every morning, every afternoon. I'm on the Great Ocean Road in Australia. If you know that area, it is spectacular. So I'm getting some great photos like this one here. And I think I'm absolutely killing it. It's time to enter another photo competition. You know, I'm going to do really, really well. I entered my first one. I came ninth. So let's go in. I've got all this new great work. It's all colorful, incredible skies. I enter 10 images into the Better Photography Awards, judged by Peter Eastway himself. A great awards, a great Australian-based photography awards. I enter 10 into there. I get the results back a couple of months later. It's three or four months into the trip. 10 awards. 10 entries, I don't even, I think I got one award, one bronze medal, and it was like right on the cusp of bronze. And here I am expecting to get silvers and golds and probably win the entire thing. So all of a sudden I've gone from being high confidence, yeah, I'm going to be a professional photographer, to what on earth have I done? I'm, I'm nowhere near that level. I got this reality check that, hang on a minute, not only are you not at the level where you think you are, but you're so far away from there that you've probably made a huge mistake. 
the good news was I had 18 months left to travel, left to think about it. I could have turned home and, and quit and gone home, but I didn't. I decided to stick it out, but my prior priorities changed. I changed my priorities from wanting to be a professional photographer. I still wanted that, but I changed my goal from that to in the next 18 months, I'm going to improve my photography to the level of a professional photographer. That's what I'm going to focus on. So what I did, I every evening I got on the internet and I bought courses, online courses, and I studied and I bought magazines and I read articles and I YouTubed and I Googled for 18 months solid. And my photography started to improve almost instantly. Every couple of weeks I was looking at my photos thinking, that is the best photo you've ever taken. And then a month later, no, that one is. And it kept upgrading, upgrading, upgrading. Okay, there's nothing wrong with this photo that I'm showing you here, but it represents a very early part of my photographic journey where all I cared about was the sky, the color of the sky. I didn't really care about the foreground or the composition or anything else. It was just the blazing sky was going to carry me to glory. The red, the orange, the beautiful pink skies. And look, there's nothing wrong with that either. But when everyone's pretty much doing that, a lot of people in their early days, you know, that's what it's all about. It's, it's not really authentically me. It, it, I wasn't putting any of myself, my soul, my heart, my story into that photography. And I didn't even know that was a thing at that point. Story and soul and authenticness, you know, being authentically me or expressing myself. You know, art at its core is about self-expression. That is what art is about. Every, I suppose, famous seems like the wrong word to use, but every famous artist that has ever lived has been incredible at being able to do one thing. And I'm not talking about painting or sculpture. Yeah, they've been great at that, but they've been incredible at being able to express themselves, to put their heart and soul into their whatever photography, painting, sculpture, poetry, songwriting. Okay? That was really, really important. We'll talk about more about that in a minute. At this point, I'm just chasing color. And yes, I was passionate about that at that point, but I needed to grow. I needed to grow. I'm not suggesting you need to grow. But if you start getting bored with what you're doing, that's your creative genius saying, give me more. Give me more growth. Give me more purpose. Give me more meaning to what we're doing. We're putting in a lot of effort, but we're not getting a lot of meaning and purpose back. Okay, so if you've lost your mojo, look for more meaning and purpose would be my advice. So we went from that and I started studying online and studying my favorite photographers. And these are two photos that I produced only a matter of weeks later. And you might argue that this is a better photo and that's perfectly okay, but I truly believe that these are better photos and I'd stumbled onto a formula that would turn out to be really, really successful for me and really, really successful in doing well, eventually doing well in photo competitions consistently. And that is the importance of light, great light, the importance of simplicity, and the importance of a strong subject. Okay, and I stumbled across, across this by looking at my favorite photographers and pulling apart their work into the elements that made it up. So I was looking at the likes of Christian Fletcher, Tony Hewitt, and Peter Eastway. They were my favorites, as well as Ken Duncan, but I was transitioning to more influences. So now my photography was influenced by four photographers, a broader range. So I was getting a different style of photography, but I was also noticing the likes of Peter East in Peter Eastway's work that nearly all of his photos included a big, bold, strong subject to anchor the composition. And I love that about his work. So instead of just having Ken Duncan's influence of the big wide panoramic with the bold colors, still got a bit of that there, but I thought, oh, I like that from Peter Eastway. I might bring in a big, bold subject into some of my compositions. I noticed from Christian Fletcher that a lot of his images had a beautiful golden light that was entering from the far right or the far left. And I thought, oh yeah, I like that about uh, Christian's work. And I was taking all these little 
things that I liked from these photographers that, are, that were influencing me, was putting them in a big pot, stirring them up, and what I was pulling out was starting to be more authentically me. I still wasn't including any of my heart or soul really, but I was starting to combine things based on what I liked visually into something that was more me. And even, even today, this, this is one of the early images, okay? This is 10 years old, but I can see my style, and I processed this 10, 15 years ago, but I can see my current day style in this image here, which is really phenomenal to me. So, And that was pulling together the likes of, you know, Ken Duncan with the panoramic style, Peter Eastway with a big, strong, bold subject, Christian Fletcher's beautiful golden sideline. You know, those kind of things, pulling them in together and then creating something that was much, much more authentically me. As I said, I still wasn't into my story yet. In fact, the next image, we start, this is the big breakthrough. So I traveled Australia for 12 months and I arrived in Perth and I was the most depressed I'd been in my life which was a pretty daunting feeling because I just spent the last 12 months doing exactly what I wanted to do. No work, no apparently no stress, no pressure, no expectations other than my own. And I got to Perth and I'm feeling really down, really depressed, really blue, really anxious. And I got some help and I saw some, and I saw some people and I changed my lifestyle a bit and it helped tremendously. This was the breakthrough through for me, not only on a mental health level, but also an artistic level. They both happened at the same time. Whilst I was terribly depressed at that period in my life, I took this photo. I went down to the Perth Boat Shed, an iconic um, photography location in Perth on the Swan River, inspired by an image that I'd seen from who is now a good mate of mine, Luke Austin. Look up the work of Luke Austin on Instagram. Phenomenal. And you probably see the image that I'm talking about. But I wanted to capture this image in the pouring rain, specifically because there's a riverbank on the other side behind the boat shed, and I wanted the rain to obscure that out, to diffuse the riverbank and remove it from the image, rendering the image as simplistic as possible with just a subject and a grey sky. Now, I didn't know why I produced this image. I came home and I processed it that evening. And I produced this particular image here. And at the time, it was completely subconscious. This is what just fell out. This is the process. It just happened. But you can see it's very dark, very gloomy, very isolated, rather lonely, if you like, rather depressing. It was a reflection of what I was feeling at the time. And it was the very first time in my entire photographic artistic journey that I had produced something that was based on my own personal emotions, okay? The very first time. I didn't really know it. I wasn't conscious of it. I wasn't producing it because I wanted to produce a dark, lonely image. I just felt dark and lonely, and this is a reflection of that in the processing of this image. Now, this is really, really significant on a couple of levels. First of all, I'd finally struck what I believe is the pot of gold, the pot of inspiration for a lot of artists. And that is your own story and your own emotions and your own inspiration comes from within. And it also happened to be a breakthrough image. I decided that after 12 months, I would enter a few more images into a photo competition. I entered the loop, again, the loop 2012, so two years later, photographic awards. And this image here was awarded a gold medal one of only two gold medals and finished second in the 2012 Loop Awards. So all of a sudden, the first image that I ever produced that came from my heart, came from my soul, was also the image that was then recognized at the highest level for the very first time. Could be a coincidence, or maybe there was something else going on. Maybe. My muse. So I leave Perth and I come back to Sydney come back to Sydney, and I wasn't a professional photographer. In fact, I hadn't earned a single dollar in the two years of traveling Australia from photography. I'd improved my photography, I think, to a higher level, much closer to a professional level. 
But when I got back to Sydney, I had to go back to building. I had to rent a new house because we didn't have one. I had to buy all the furniture, you know, so life got busy and I had to earn some income to pay the bills again. Photography wasn't doing the job. So I had to go back to building. My wife was also pregnant. We were having our first, well, and only child. My little boy Lachlan was to be born later that year. So I decided it was time to put the camera down and focus on earning a living for the next six months. So I did that, zipped it up, put it in the cupboard, didn't pick it up for six months. But during that six months, it was the most important period of my entire life. Not only, well, not only did I not pick up the camera, but because I wasn't picking up the camera and I was still passionate about photography, every time I was driving to work or had a free moment, I was thinking about two and probably the most important questions any artist can ever ask themselves. Number one, what do I want my photos to look like? And number two, what do I want my photos to say? What stories do I want to tell through my photography? And it took a while. I was contemplating those two questions for probably three or four months before it finally dawned on me that to really create purposeful, meaningful, emotional art. It was one of my goals at that time to create emotional art. And I thought creating emotional art was just darkening and having dark and gloomy images. And to a certain degree it is. But if you don't understand the darkness behind a dark and gloomy image, if you don't have the backstory necessarily, then it just becomes a hollow, superficial kind of image. And I'm not sure you can ever reach the depths, the emotional depths, without experiencing the darkness yourself. Uh, maybe you can, maybe you can't, I don't know. But I, for me, suddenly it dawned on me that the most, the biggest emotional impact on my life was once again, anxiety and depression because I was back building, my dreams were far away, I was getting exhausted and tired again and I thought well it's time that I invest in some time into creating a series of work based on that darkness, based on my living with anxiety and depression. And This was the first image I produced. When I picked up the camera again, this was the image and the first image that I produced within that sort of dark, gloomy, isolation, depression series, consciously. Now, interestingly enough, as I said with the previous image, this image went on to win multiple gold awards. It was part of a portfolio that won me the 2014, was it 2014? I think. Yeah, 2014 Emerging Photographer of the Year for the AIPP APA Awards. It won Focus Image of the Year among a couple of thousand other images. And again, I'm thinking, well, hang on a minute. The first two images that I've ever produced that came straight from the most authentic place that I've ever visited artistically, both impacted the judges on an emotional level. You generally, well, when I'm judging, I don't award a gold award unless I can feel the story, unless it impacts me emotionally. So these two images were starting to do that. And they were also the first two images that I produced from directly inside my heart. Here's another one, okay? This is a much later image in that series, and it's called The Darkest Day, this particular one. Let me tell you a little story about this one. We're probably getting close to the end of the presentation, another 20, 30 minutes, I would say. Sorry that it's dragging on. I hope you're enjoying it with a cup of tea. Um, but this one is called The Darkest Day. I'd finally, I'd finally sort of cracked it. I was starting to crack it as a professional photographer and drawing income. And a mate of mine, Ignacio Palacios, said, come on a workshop with me to Iceland. Myself, Luke Austin and Ignacio Palacios, we went to Iceland and we had a whole bunch of passionate photographers come with us. And not only did we do a tour of Iceland for 10 days, we then backed it up with a 10 day tour of Norway. It ended up being about 24 days over in Iceland of intense workshop teaching. And I soon found out that I'm not cut out for workshop, that style of workshop, because 
mainly because I'm a people pleaser and I don't know when to say no. When my energy is dropping, I keep giving, giving, giving. Yes, more tutorials, more Photoshop, more this, more that. Absolutely wrecked myself. Abs I didn't know when to stop, just ruined myself. Came home, fell into the deepest, darkest place I've ever been. And on about day two or three of finding it hard to even get out of bed, and I'm sure a lot of you have been in that place before, I, I said to myself, right, let's get out of bed and create. You don't, I don't want to, but let's do it. Let's see what happens. And I got out, and I was kind of in this foggy haze, didn't know what was going on, had no real conscious thought process, and I produced this image. The only conscious thought process I had was to try and produce something that felt as dark as what I was feeling at that particular time. All these images just came together. It's a composite. There's one, two, three, maybe four or five images in there. And it just fell together. Now when I look at this, it's probably the most poetic, chock-a-block full of metaphor images that I've ever produced. And it's probably, probably my favorite. You know, we've got the dark, lonely, isolated shed or house there much similar to the boat shed, which represents loneliness, isolation, surrounded by the darkness of those clouds, captured through these creepy, spooky-looking trees, which give a sense of being hidden or maybe trapped or maybe they're draining or maybe they're a cage of anxiety, all of these things. The colour palette is very green and spooky and intimidating, I suppose. Uh, what else have we got there? The reflection is a sense of self-reflections maybe that you feel. I can be very harsh on myself when I'm feeling very down. The blurry foreground, I just did it. It looked good. It looked right. But I didn't know why. And in hindsight, it's because the, even as something as strong and as stable as the ground I was standing on didn't feel real, didn't feel like reality. It felt foggy and blurry. So hence the, the foreground, the ground I'm standing on is blurry as well. This is the only image in the series which is now called The Darkest Days, which also includes this image and this image and a few others, that doesn't have a ray of light. The ray of light in the rest of the images represents hope. This image I left the ray of light out because I was feeling rather hopeless, but I included hope. I didn't know I was including hope, but I did. There is two birds sitting centrally sort of snuggled together in the darkness, giving each other uh, support, if you like. And that's the support of my friends and family that are always there for me. So there's always hope even in the darkest days that the days will clear and there is hope. Now, to just elaborate a fraction on this image, I entered this into the APA AIPP um, Awards back in about 2016, I think, maybe 15, 16, I think it was. And I sent the image off to my printer, Paul Jarvis from Perth ProLab. Shout out. Look up Paul if you're doing some printing. He's got his printers at home and he's still printing if you're interested in getting some work printed. Look him up. And I sent him an email and I said to Paul, Paul, this image is about darkness and loneliness and depression. I need you to choose a paper that represents that. It can't be on a glossy paper because it's not a glossy story. And every element of your art needs to come together to complement the story. Okay, so the paper choice needs to complement the dark story. He thought about that for a couple of days and he was having a few beers with his print staff. I think it must, I think it was a Friday afternoon and I get a text message from Paul and it's just an image of my photograph that's been printed out. And then what do you think under that? And they'd printed out the image. They'd been chatting over some ideas and Paul came up with the idea, I think, to print out this image on a beautiful, delicate matte paper, a Japanese Kozo. It's rather matte paper, very fine with a beautiful grain in it, very soft, almost like the, almost like a feather grain running through it. Beautiful, delicate. Delicate is good for this story. It's a delicate story, delicate balance. And when it came off the printer, he got that piece of paper and scrunched it into a ball like that and then unraveled it you know so it looked like this and then sent me a photo and I was just gobsmacked I was blown away I was offended I was like you can't be screwing up someone else's artwork 
but I didn't reply. I thought, hang on, I like crazy stuff. This is pretty crazy. Let's think about this for a while. And about one or two minutes later, I'm texting him back. You're a genius. We're definitely doing that. We're definitely submitting a scrunched up artwork to the AIPP awards, the APA awards. Because what do you do with a worthless piece of paper? And worthless is an emotion that I was feeling. You scrunch it up and you throw it away. Okay. But then you have that moment of clarity and you think, well, hang on a minute. You know, you pick that back up. Maybe there is some redeeming qualities to this image and you unravel that image and maybe take it out in the sun in better light and you notice that not only is the image extraordinarily powerful and extraordinarily valuable and worthy in its own right, but the scrunching up and the creases that have been left through that process, that hardship, add extra value to that image. They add a layer of interest that wasn't there before. They add a layer of depth that wasn't there before. They make the image more interesting through the hardship that it's had to go through. And for those of you that might be experiencing hardship now, and I've sure experienced it, I'm of the belief. It's not good. I, I don't wish it on anyone. I certainly don't. But I am of the belief that that hardship can make you more valuable, more interesting, you know, more valuable to others to be able to share that experience and help others that are hurting, that are feeling that. You know, more interesting that you've, you've experienced the lows and you know the difference between the lows and the highs. So this is an image that, play, that pays homage to going through the dark days, but also having more value at the end of that, I suppose. If anyone ever buys this as a print, it comes scrunched up in a little black box, okay? Take that down to your framer. So can you unravel that and frame it up for me? Watch the look on his face, it should be a beauty. But imagine that hanging on the wall, beautiful, hauntingly beautiful, in, at least in my opinion, and it's only my opinion, scrunched up piece of artwork. Imagine the conversation that that might generate. Have we got any questions? I'm just having a look through the comments here. Doug says, what did Doug say? I just saw it. Oh, Sue Ellen says, I remember seeing this one and thinking, wow, that's how I feel and what I do in my work emotionally. Wow, that's incredible, Sue Ellen. I knew there was a little bit of darkness behind your work. Um, wow, wow, beautiful. Donnie C says, love that story. I'm glad I can share that with you and I'm glad there's a, you know, I, you know, it's part of the ability. It helps me emotionally to tell you because now I'm not afraid of that. There's a stigma attached, particularly I think with males being really strong and nothing's wrong. We're always there. We're the rock. And I think um, for me to be able to share that, I don't know how many people are watching now, um, but to, for me to be able to share that with everyone that watches this over the next coming days, weeks, months, whatever, it just allow. you know, I'm not scared of that anymore because everyone knows about me that that's part of my past and part of my artwork and part of who I am. So hopefully, you know, if you're feeling scared about that, number one, you know, don't be, and that's hard to say, it's really hard to say, and it's hard to bring up with friends and family, I know. But for me, you know, pick up a camera, pick up a paintbrush, paint some dark black paint on a canvas, create some dark imagery with your camera and start communicating. I started communicating my anxiety and depression first through my art and that gave me the strength and confidence to then communicate it verbally in reference to my art. Look, I still wouldn't probably be able to stand up and say, you know, at a mental health conference, it would be very difficult to stand up and just talk purely about my experience of, of mental health without having my art as a shield. But with my art as a shield, I feel I have the confidence to express that. So I would say if, you, if you're having trouble with that kind of, with mental health, pick up a camera, pick up a pencil, pick up some paint, create some dark black, throw some red in there, really throw it down, get the aggression down, get the frustration down. And look, you might create an absolute masterpiece and you might start a journey that you never knew was there. Um, of course, speaking about mental health, I can't go without saying, you know, if you're having trouble, Google 
the relevant authorities. Here in Australia, we've got Lifeline and Beyond Blue who are all there to help. Talk to a friend. Um, I've spoken to you know these people before about my own problems and issues, and it really, really helps. So um, you know, use those avenues if you need to. Send me an email and say, hey, thanks for your story. I've got a similar story, and just you know, reach out that way too. All right, um, we're all here. We're all here for each other to support each other, it's particularly within this little community that we're now creating here on our YouTube live. Okay. I won't cheapen it with a, you know, let's keep moving. 2000 and 2014, as I mentioned, was a breakthrough year. 2014 was also the year that I first discovered my passion, my muse for creating artwork based on whatever was emotionally affecting me. And we'll talk more in depth about my art in the coming days and the latest bodies of work that I've produced. 2014. As I said, I managed to be awarded the AIPP APA Emerging Photographer of the Year. Phenomenal. Never thought that was ever a possibility. And I was completely shocked and completely nervous when I, had, when I was invited to the gala dinner in Sydney and had to stand up in front of none other than Tony Hewitt, Christian Fletcher, I think might have been there. He may not have been. I'm not sure, actually. No, I think he was, I don't think he was there, to be honest. But Peter Eastway and Tony Hewitt were definitely there. I'm standing in front of all my professional photography idols, accepting an award, mind blown. I didn't know what was going on. But I knew one thing, that it was a sign that I should keep pushing because I still at this point hadn't earned a single dollar from photography other than the prize money that I was awarded for this particular competition. It was a sign. I'm on the right path. Keep going. Listen to your intuition. Listen to those signs. Okay. Is my mouse right in the middle of the screen? It probably was. Sorry about that. Okay. Now, not only did I win that, this image, this is the first ever time I entered the Australian APA Print Awards, probably the biggest, in my opinion, awards in Australia because it's populated by the best well, not the best, some of the best photographers, not all the best photographers in Australia are in the AIPP. I understand that, but a lot of them are, and a lot of them are entering this particular awards. This image right here was awarded a 96 out of 100 gold distinction, and Tony Hewitt went on a 10-minute rant throughout the judging on how incredible this image was and how much emotion was jam-packed. I was in a blithering, crying mess on the floor because I'd spent the last three years and think of all the sacrifices and all the risks that I'd taken to get to this point of creating purposeful, emotional storytelling photography. That journey progressed as we went through those risks and went along that journey. But here was Tony Hewitt reading my image like he had a script to read from. Phenomenal. I was so emotional that it had come to this stage and I'd sort of made that breakthrough. It just made me want to keep going, keep going, keep going. We'll skip through these. The following year in 2015, I was awarded the New South Wales AIPP Landscape Photographer and Professional Photographer of the Year. Again, producing images that were mostly from my heart. I won't say they were all from my heart, but mostly. 2016, New South Wales AIPP Landscape Photographer of the Year again, and backed it up for the third time in 2017 with AIPP, New South Wales Landscape Photographer and Professional Photographer that particular year. Absolutely just mind blown that that could happen among that quality field. Hasn't happened since. That's okay. That's okay. I've been following my goals, following my passion, as you will see. Skipping through my most recent presentation, my most recent inspiration, or sorry, one of my most recent inspirations was the Romantic Landscape, photog not photographers, the Romantic Landscape Painters of the mid-1800s, in particular, Albert Bierstad. Can you see the influence from this image? If we duck back to this image, I think so. To be honest, this image is not a lot of heart and soul. It's an image that I've smashed together with the influence of the Romantic painters, specifically, if I'm honest, specifically to do well in photo competitions. Did it do well? 
not as well as some of my other heartfelt images, okay? It did okay, and it was awarded um, some pretty high awards, but I tend to steer clear of chasing those awards purely for chasing them. Now I tend to work as authentically from the heart as possible, and I don't worry about the results, if you like, or I don't worry about what people say about it. If it's authentically from me, then it's only there to please me and tell my story. And it doesn't matter what other people think. And you'll see that later in a couple of slides as we skip through here. Another recent inspiration that I've pushed my creativity to a whole new level was the Light Collective, a collaboration of five photographers that joined in 2014 with a view to inspire each other to a new level of creativity. It's grown from that now where we produce bodies of work on high value environmental areas that we believe deserve more awareness and more conservation. So we travel to these areas and produce a book, produce a project and try and show how important they are to be protected and conserved. Okay, we've done Lake Eyre, Cat Eye Thunder in Outback South Australia. We then went to the Great Barrier Reef and produced a project called Black and Blue. I'll show you some work of that in the coming weeks, days. And we've just begun a project on the Tarkine region of Tasmania, which is coming up in the next six to 12 months, depending on when we can get down there and shoot it again. Recent work, I'll skip through these, influenced by the romantic painters of the 1850s. Another recent image also inspired by that period. Okay, I will do an in-depth on this particular image. The interesting thing about this particular image, and I mentioned it the other day, it's a great demonstration of how Photoshop can tell the truth better than our cameras can sometimes. Okay? This was the biggest storm swell that I'd ever seen. The biggest storm swell at home at Crescent Head that I'd ever seen. And I got my cameras out. And when I framed it up as a wide angle shot, the waves looked tiny. So tiny like this. And I thought, well, that doesn't have the power and the feeling and the energy of these waves that are smacking against the headland and throwing spray up 40, 50 feet. And I could feel the thump in my chest. You know when fireworks go thuk, like that? Like, you know when you feel that and it hits you in the chest? That's what these waves, the sound wave was hitting me in the chest. Enormous energy from these waves. And it was just wide angle, tiny, tiny waves. So I thought, what am I going to do? Now, with a wide angle lens, you need to get close to the subject. I could probably catch the intensity and the energy of these waves, but I would have to stand in frame here on these foreground rocks. Okay, on those foreground rocks, I have to stand there. That's not going to end well. So I said to myself, well, that won't work. How can I do this? So what I did, I took the wide angle shot. That's the foreground you can see here, the headland and the waves in the, and the white water in the foreground. And then I captured about 100 different shots, about 100 different shots of... Sorry, I was just checking that we we're still live here. You've gone quiet on the comments, but I think we're still good. <laughs> we might be only talking to one or two people now. Um, I took about 100 different shots of different big waves with my 400 mil lens. And then I came into Photoshop and I blended together the wide angle shot. Maybe it was a 30 mil, 35 mil frame with the 400 mil waves, the giant waves. And I blended them through here. And the power and intensity and feeling that that brings to this shot represents to me a much more authentic feeling than what the camera could capture all by itself. Okay, so it was a case of either get it in one shot and not get the emotion and not get the feeling in the shot, or experiment and try and get it in a number of different shots and produce something that I feel captures the truth of the scene on a much, much higher level. Okay, so Photoshop gets a really bad rap of being a liar and a cheat. And look, I don't, to be honest, I probably am one of the worst to blame for that. You know, I do a lot of lying and cheating in Photoshop, or at least have done in my past. But I tend to use Photoshop more so now to create a more authentic story that matches my vision as best as I possibly can. 
Okay, so there's a little bit of a why Photoshop or how Photoshop can create the truth rather than being a liar and a cheat all the time. Still there, I can still see some comments. Yeah, we will do an in-depth on that particular photo, absolutely. Absolutely. Another image here, we'll take a closer look at this one later as well, an incredible storm. The raw file on this is absolutely horrible, it's horrendous, it should have been deleted. But when I processed it through Photoshop and pulled the detail back out, it created this phenomenal storm cell. Okay, the rainbow was there. Absolutely, I didn't cheat there. Not that I have a problem with that. And wrapping it up to my absolute, I know that's a blank screen. Bear with me, I wanted the blank screen there so I knew what was coming next. My latest body of work. This is a body of work. This is a body of work that I have been waiting for. For 15 years. It's what I've always wanted. In fact, I'll come through to the next slide. It's something that I've always wanted. I've always desired is this truly authentic body of work. And it's taken me 15 years. The reason it's taken 15 years is twofold. One, I had to be artistically confident enough to produce it whilst not caring about what other people think about it. Because this body of work, I haven't shared much of it, but when I have shared it, I get a high percentage of people telling me that I should keep doing what I used to do before this style. This romantic style. This is a more appealing to the masses style of photography. Yes, I understand it. But this body of work is more personally appealing and it's calling me. It's calling me to produce it. I have to produce it. So I needed to be confident enough as an artist not to be distracted or persuaded to stop it, to stop doing it when people told me it's not very good. Okay? I had to be confident enough in that. Secondly, I needed to be confident enough, and this is a bit of a fib to be honest, I needed to be confident enough, this is what I've been telling myself, that strong enough mentally to go back into the darkness and produce this work but it turns out I've been producing this work whilst recently in relatively dark periods of time with high anxiety with the latest you know what we're dealing with worldwide and you know what that's that makes this body of work to me more powerful more relevant more authentic because I've been producing it and editing it in this dark, uncertain period of time, and that's what it represents, this body of work, and I've only, I'm only going to show you three, three, yeah, three pieces, this body of work represents the uncertainty, the expectations, the stresses, the anxiety, and the depression that might come with that of a middle-aged, 40-odd-year-old artist like myself and I know a lot of you are out there might be different ages but you've been through this you're going through this and this is for you this is for you I hope that this body of work offers you some comfort that someone else understands the loneliness and the isolation and the darkness that can come with that mental state and I know a lot more people are going to understand this and it's not a good thing but hopefully this brings you some comfort that this is you know this is for you on a second level if you've never understood anxiety or the darkness of depression but maybe you've got a friend or a son or a daughter or a granddaughter or grandson or grandfather or mother or father whoever it might be that suffers anxiety and depression I'm hoping that this will give you an insight to what that feels like this is the series the darkest day series that includes Let's skip back. You know, where are we? Here, this, this, and this is a visual representation of what anxiety and depression is like, visually, more so. Whereas this new body of work, I'm trying to capture the essence of the feeling more so. Okay? This particular piece here, you can see, is got a searing eyeball staring down, if you like, at this lonely soul, um, dark soul there, the dark soul representing myself and the eyeball represents that, you know, that searing judgment and expectations that can weigh really, really heavily 
on fragile people. I've been there. I know what that feels like. Okay. Maybe some people are going to tell me this work sucks. <laughs> and that's the kind of thing that can create that judgment. But we live in a judgmental type world. And I understand that everyone has their own opinion and you don't have to like this. That's okay. It's completely okay. It's not for you. Um, art is for the artist. Absolutely. And if anyone else resonates with that, that's a bonus. But at the core, art is 100% produced to please or to tell the story, or to get something off the chest of the artist, in my opinion. At least that's my opinion. Let me show you some more. Okay. A butterfly to me represents tremendous hope and change, that I can change myself, the future can change, we can come out of these dark days as maybe more positive, more beautiful, with a, with a much more caring and compassionate perspective. Maybe that is what we're going to be gifted from the dark days we're currently in. But from my dark days, maybe that's what I've been gifted from the experience is that I can understand with a little more compassion, I suppose, than someone that hasn't been there. And we'll talk, I'm going to do a full presentation on this work at a later date. And then there's this one. This was the first image of this series that I ever created that started the whole journey. And it was like I was spoken to from my creative genius. It was like hearing these incredible church choir. When this image popped up on the back of the screen, I was like, I have found it. I have finally found it. And if you're looking out there searching for that one body of work that is really authentically you, if you're looking for your style, don't look for it on Instagram. Don't look for it in Photoshop. It's in here. It's within you. Your authentic style comes from your stories, consistently telling your own personal stories. That's where it comes from. Absolutely. I can guarantee you that. If you're looking for it, you know, who is Adam Williams? It's a cheesy question. Absolutely. It's a cheesy question. But I had to ask myself that first before I was gifted the inspiration to create my most important work, which I believe this is. And look, you're probably looking at me going, you probably should wait another 15 years because this ain't it. This ain't it. But there'll be 5%, 10% of people that know what I'm talking about, that have been there. It's, it's for me and it's for you guys, okay? It will resonate with a small fraction of the population. That's what art's about. If your art is appealing to everyone, don't get me wrong. If you're trying to sell art, sell photography, it is your job to appeal to the masses. But if you're doing art for art's sake, and this sounds cheesy as you like, I understand that. But if you're doing art for art's sake, and you, you're probably not going to appeal to everyone. In fact, if you are appealing to everyone, you're probably doing it wrong. You're probably not getting as authentic as you possibly can be. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, guess what? This series is also developed into a second spin-off series, if you like. I didn't want this series necessarily. And in fact, as it turns out, it's going to be all doom and gloom, this particular series. It's going, this series is going to form its own body of work called My Shadow, the darkness that follows me around. But there's another series where I've infused some hope. So I am the middle-aged 40-year-old that is struggling with stress and anxiety and expectations and the judgment of others. That's me, absolutely. What do I want? I see my five-year-old boy full of joy and spontaneity and fun. And I just want a little piece of that pie. I want a little bit more of that, a little bit more play, a little bit more carefree. So I've created a body of work that combines the two together with the help of my little five-year-old boy. And I'll show you the rest of that body of work I've just got an iPhone shot of the kind of thing that I'm producing. Okay. We're taking the darkness and we're infusing that with the carefree, spontaneity, fun, joy of just being a little kid. You know, I want more of that. And that's, you know, that's where my life is at. And as an artist, it's our job to project what you want your life to be or what your life is through your art. Less people are going to connect with this probably than the other work. 
They're going to say I'm crazy. I've had emails from people saying this work sucks, essentially. Okay. I entered a body of work much similar to this into the AIPP last year. And surprisingly, it got three silvers. I was hoping for better, but in hindsight, three silvers was phenomenal for a body of work that was this jarring. Absolutely incredible that they awarded it at that. They, you know, in hindsight, maybe 70 points, 50 points wasn't out of the realm, out of 100. But on an artistic level, I need to ask myself, does this do the job? Does it communicate what I want it to communicate? What does it say to you? I mean, I, I only have to ask you, I suppose, what does this image say to you? Can you feel the loneliness and the darkness? Those are probably the two main elements throughout this body. And then as we switch to this collaboration, can you feel, you can still see the loneliness and the darkness behind there and the contemplation of that soul figure, but can you feel and see the joy and carefree and spontaneity of a childlike five-year-old drawing over the top? Okay. And if you can feel that, then absolutely I've achieved my goal. This now, if, I, if you can feel that, it has achieved and represented my life right at this very point. Stress, isolation, confinement, loneliness, contemplation, with dreams of, carefree, spontaneity, fun, joy, happiness. Okay? That's it. I know it was a long, long, long presentation. I probably lost half of you along the way, to be honest. <laughs> Let's have a look and see if there's any questions. Let's have a quick look at questions. Um, let me find my mouse here. I'll just flick up a little bit. Dean says, powerful image. Um, Doug says he's been waiting for these. Well, thank you. I assume, I'm hoping, I'm wondering if you're talking about the My Shadow series or I haven't got a name for this body of work yet. It will eventually come. And I, I do plan on hopefully exhibiting the two bodies of work together. The dark, lonely figures down one side of the gallery, I vision, and the dark, lonely figures covered in joy, spontaneity, carefree attitude, like, Kids, have you seen kids draw? They don't care if anyone likes it. They just draw for the sake of drawing. This is a rainbow. It doesn't look like a rainbow. I think we can all see it as a metaphor for a rainbow, but that's the carefree joy of a rainbow that you get from a four or five-year-old um, child. Just having fun, just color for the sake of color. It's brilliant. It's beautiful. Thank you, Doug. Cheryl says, totally true. Even the most true mu musicians like progressive rock, et cetera, et cetera, don't create music for their fans. No, absolutely they don't. They create it and tell their own stories. If there's one thing that I want you to get from this presentation or take away, and look, if you're at the beginning of your photography, it's not going to really ring true just yet, but keep that with you, that the end goal for most artists is self-expression. Okay, to get as close to self as possible in their artwork. Um, and I think, look, I think this, this piece that's on screen right now, there's a lot of you out there in these dark times that are probably feeling the same, like dark, isolated, lonely, uncertain, contemplating the future, and you just wish it was carefree and fun and spontaneous. I tell you what, if you've got a little kid, or even if you don't, get some pens and crayons, and just draw like you don't care. It's so much fun. Lose yourself in it. It's incredible. Metamorphosis. Yeah, absolutely. That butterfly image um, is more than likely going to be called metamorphosis, in fact. And the eye has a cataract. Impending clear vision. Beautiful, Doug. I love that metaphor. I'm going to steal it. See you tomorrow. Ren had to run. That's fine. Roberta says, this is how I feel. Roberta, this is for you. Absolutely. Beautiful. Thank you. It only needs to connect with one soul being the artist, but if it connects with another, it's a brilliant thing. Ray says, it was really inspiring. Thanks, Ray. I'm glad you found it that way. Absolutely. Looks like Ed, Edvard Monk's Scream, this one. I'm not sure which one that was. I do have another image that looks incredibly like that. I'll show you that in the coming days. 
Sonny says, yep, being there resonates with me totally. You know, thank you so much.